Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our October edition of the Science of Slack series. Um, today, we have uh, Riti Sarangi here from the Structural Molecular Biology Group, Biology Group at SSRL. Um, Riti earned her Master's of Science in Chemistry from the India Institute of Technology and her PhD from Stanford, in, also in chemistry, in 2007. Uh, her expertise is in hard X-ray spectroscopy, and her research focus on, focuses on understanding the geometric and electronic structure of metalloproteins. Uh, today, she's going to introduce us to this important topic and discuss some recent results. Her presentation is titled, Life Support, the Critical Role of Metals in Biology. Uh, please join me in welcoming Riti. Thank you. Can you hear me? I guess. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as David said, my title is Life Support, The Critical Role of Metals in Biology. Um, the, my talk is going to be at a very lay level so everyone can understand. But if you have any specific questions about the experiment or the result, you can ask me at the end in the question and answer session. Um, okay, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to introduce uh, what are metals doing in biology, um, what are metalloproteins and why do we care. I'm going to introduce spectroscopy and color, then specifically talk about um, SSRL spectroscopy, what I do at SSRL, um, and then um, a little following up on that, a little about what we get out of spectroscopy um, what we do when we study metalloproteins, and then talk about a recent study. <coughs> so this is um, a periodic table of dietary elements. Um, there are, dietary elements are divided into four possible classes. The first one is the organic basic elements. We all know we need hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen to survive. That's 99% of organic matter. Um, then there are other elements that are required in large quantities, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, some here. Um, then there is this elements in light green, which are called essential trace elements. And they're all um, either metallic or uh, some of them are non-metallic. And then there are some elements in um, yellow, which are basically um, other metals that, are, that, are, that don't occur um, biologically, but sometimes we ingest, for example, we take platinum for can cancer protection, things like that. Now, let's focus on the essential trace elements for a bit. <coughs> there are the inorganic, um, um, sorry, non-metallic kinds, the selenium, bromine, and iodide. You know that because you take selenium supplements and you have iodized molten salt. And then we have these metals, we have manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and molybdenum. Each one of us has these elements inside our body. And um, you're going to ask me, really, all these metals um, in that form? Um, the key word here is trace. They're available in very small quantities. And the other is form. They don't look like that anymore inside our body. They're present. Um, integrated with organic material. So they look and feel like organic matter. Um, an obvious example is blood in all vertebrates. Um, and as we all know, we have blood in iron. That iron is integrated into a protein called hemoglobin um, and um, looks and feels organic. I'll leave you with a question here, which I'll come back to you. Why are red blood cells red, and why are they not green? And we'll discuss this later. If you know the answers, you can tell me. OK. So hemoglobin is a protein that is essential to life. It plays the important role of oxygen carrier in the body. So it goes to the lungs. As you breathe, it grabs the oxygen, takes it, and releases it to the various parts of the body. And that's how we survive. Um, this is a structure of hemoglobin, as would be solved by experiments at SSRL. Um, <laughs> but the way to think about it in a very simple format is to think that the protein is an un unraveled ball of wool and that has these four plate-like 
molecules in it somewhere. Um, so together, these unra this unravel ball of wool and the four plates make the hemoglobin molecule. Now you'll ask me, so would the plates fall out if I shook the ball of wool? The answer is no. Um, that's because these plates um, are held together by the protein. So this represents a string of the protein, and that is forming a very strong bond with an iron atom which is at the center of that plate. That's one way the woolly matrix is holding that plate. The other way is that this plate is wedged inside that protein woolly structure in, in a small little cavity which forms additional weak interactions from stuff around it which holds it in place. And that is the way almost all proteins that contain metals um, are structurally. They have one to four metal atoms, mostly. There are some proteins that have more metal atoms. Um, they have strong bond to amino acids, which are building blocks of the proteins, which is what is attaching to this iron here, surrounded by a woolly ma matrix. <coughs> now, I'm going to use probably metalloproteins and metalloenzymes interchangeably. It's, it's a terminology that um, we use very frequently, interchangeably in my field. Now, I said that hemoglobin had an iron center, which looks like a plate. Um, there are various interesting structures of these proteins inside the body. There's one which has iron and sulfur in this cube-like fashion, and there's some random structures, which is manganese, calcium, and oxygen. I'll come back to that at the end. And these proteins perform a wide range of function. They carry oxygen. As I said, hemoglobin, that's what it's doing. They form important bond, they break bond, they make chemical transformations in the body. Um, they produce oxygen in plants. So one of the most important biological reaction photosynthesis is done at this manganese site. Um, and that oxygen which is produced is um, used by animals and plants for breathing uh, <coughs> or, or using it for respiration process. The O2 is consumed by another protein which has iron and copper in it. So um, they do a wide range of functions, really, and they also transport electrons for chemical reactions all around the body, and the list really goes on. And basically, they encompass um, all species on the Earth. They're present in all the species, and they're, uh, they have a variety of structures, and they play an important role in the body. Um, but the question is, why do I care about studying these? And the first thing is scientific curiosity. Um, I want to know, why does nature choose metal in an organic framework? Why these specific metals? What are they doing there? And what happens if they either weren't there or they were replaced by something else? Um, and so as a chemist, resolving the role of elements that you typically don't associate with life is interesting to me. The other thing is the synchrotron advantage. Now, SSRL has very unique capabilities that make it uh, that bring it ahead of other techniques for studying difficult systems as metalloproteins. And some of the questions that I posed above here, um, you can easily answer them with synchrotron um, techniques. And so as an experimental scientist, applying these synchrotron techniques to these unique systems that are doing these amazing chemistry is pretty cool. Um, so you can ask me, Riti, um, you're not using taxpayer money to satisfy your curiosity, right? So how does, how, why do I care? Okay, so why should you care? Now, here I'm, I'm uh, showing you a uh, ammonia production plant. Ammonia uh, production chemically was first um, industrialized by the Haber-Bosch process, which won the Nobel Prize, and that has enabled the global population to increase about four and a half times today. Now, as you can see, this is a chemical plant. It requires a lot of energy and a lot of effort to, pr to pr mass produce ammonia. But this is a protein which has a molybdenum and iron sun center called nitrogenase in ambient temperature and ambient pressure without requiring any external force breaks an extremely stable bond in nitrogen. So it takes nitrogen from air and produces ammonia. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do it, we could learn from this and make ammonia organically? Methane 
is a main component of natural gas. It's a very clean fuel. In fact, it is a rocket fuel. And it was generated industrially first by the fischer tropsch process, which also won a Nobel Prize. A protein called MCR actually produces 1 billion tons of methane annually. It's already produced. You've heard of methane that's produced under these ice traps that's made by this, this um, enzyme, which has a nickel active site. Um, if we could use that protein to generate methane, that would solve half of our energy problem. Um, if you think about the environment, one of the big problems is carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Um, there's a protein called CODH, which has an iron and a copper and a nickel here, uh, which converts CO to CO2 and CO2 to important orga organic molecules, which can be used for good purposes from the environment. So it's take CO2 and makes into important organic molecules. So there is a lot to learn from metalloenzymes, which we can use in our life to help us in various ways. But apart from using these metalloenzymes to help us, if these metalloproteins do not function properly inside our body, we get, we get diseases like Alzheimer's, Wilson's, Parkinson's, sickle cell anemia, and many, many others. Um, they also perform a very important task of detoxifying chemicals. And, the, and nowadays, in our food and just in the environment, there are so many crazy chemicals. It would be great. It would be great to know that we do have these metalloproteins inside our body, which can fight, break down these chemicals into smaller organic form matter, <coughs> so that they're not toxic anymore. So the idea of studying metalloproteins is basically understanding and, un and replicating the chemistry of metalloproteins will have a direct and lasting impact on all aspects of our life, medicine, environment, and energy, and that's why you should care. Okay, so I've been going on about how it's used in catalysis and so many different kinds of ways. What makes metalloproteins so special? So metals have a very unique way of binding or reacting with chemicals. Um, this is a protein called hemocyanin. It has the, the two yellow spheres are coppers. Um, just like we have hemoglobin, this is something that's uh, in crabs and mollusks. It grabs oxygen, takes and releases in, inside their uh, bodies. <coughs> so again, it contains coppers and delivers oxygen. Now, when it goes to the lungs and it grabs oxygen, every time um, something, some such process happens, when a bond is formed, there is a give and take of electrons between the atoms that the bond is formed. Okay? Now, electrons typically come in pairs. They want to hang out together. But oxygen is an odd molecule. It has two electrons that are sitting separate. They're not together. And the cool thing is about metal, it, metals are that they can interact with these electrons that are sitting together, they're paired up, or electrons that are sitting uh, far away or separate. So that makes them extremely versatile um, towards reacting with all kinds of material. And that's why most catalysts um, have metals in them. One cool thing is that organic matter, our body, 99% of it, has these paired electrons. So if we didn't have metals inside our body, that first step process of respiration, breathing, you wouldn't be able to do. You wouldn't be able to consume oxygen if we didn't have the metal, it didn't have that iron sitting in, in blood to grab that oxygen, because that reaction would not happen. Okay. So I was talking about hemoglobin. Let's come back to it. And this, this is the diagram from high school um, biology books, probably, that you remember. And there we show the diagram of arteries and veins, and blood is flowing through both of them. Um, but in these books, we see that the arteries show red-colored blood, and the veins show blue-colored blood. And is that really two? true, are, are these two kinds of blood different, and do they look different? This is arterial blood, this is the blood from the veins, and you can see, yes, there is a distinct difference. The vein, the blood from the veins is bluish, bluish darker, and the 
blood from the arteries is reddish, slightly lighter. So why do we have these two kinds of blood? Why, why does the color change? Um, the answer lies in that one iron center in the protein. There is a chemical transformation in the iron center when it grabs um, the oxygen molecule, and that's why there's a color change. And what's interesting, that in this big woolly matrix, there is one iron atom which changes bonding by just a little bit, and the color changes. So to explain that a little bit, this is the hemoglobin molecule. So it has bound to four things like that, and it's also held by the protein wool at the bottom. So there's one space that's empty on top. When that is empty, when nothing is bound, it's blue in color. But when oxygen comes and binds in the lungs, um, and oxygen, uh, two oxygen atoms in an oxygen molecule, that's, why you, that's how I represented it, it turns red in color. And that is why you, you have two different um, types of um, blood in the body. Now, blood universally in the animal kingdom is not only red or blue. There is um, a type of sea squirts, which have yellow blood. There um, is a type of um, oh, cockroaches. Everybody knows if you squish a cockroach, it looks red. Uh, sorry, it looks white um, because it doesn't have any metal. Um, so it looks organic, white. And then there are horseshoe crabs. They have blue blood. This is the, hem this is the copper side that I was talking about. Um, it, because it has copper, it's blue in color. And if you look at this diagram, um, it must answer one of your questions instantly, um, which is, now you know why all the blue-blooded royals reminded you of mollusks, and <laughs> because they have blue blood. OK. All right, so the question is, why are so many metalloproteins colored? And why are red blood cells red, not green? OK. Um, for that, let me answer, um, go into the very basics of color a little bit. Probably most of you know. Um, as you know, white light is composed of a variety of um, uh, different frequencies. And that's uh, demonstrated by a prism, by a rainbow. Um, and when you uh, plot the spectrum of white light, the lower frequency is red, the higher frequency is bluish, purple. And you can take this strip and turn it around into a circle. You get the color wheel, which looks like that. And <coughs> um, when the white light passes through or is reflected by hemoglobin or, for that matter, anything that you observe, um, certain frequencies are absorbed. Um, and the reflected frequency is just the opposite of it. So if yellow was um, absorbed, you would see that object as blue. If green was absorbed, you would see it as pink or red. Um, and, that's what, um, and that's why metalloproteins are colored, because they, absorbed, uh, they absorb a lot in this visible region. That's why you see them in a variety of different colors. <coughs> And the, chem and, and the key to chemistry and color is that the chemistry around that iron atom in hemoglobin decides what frequencies will be absorbed. OK. So this brings to me to spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the field of science which studies the interaction of matter with light. Any matter absorbing light is um, study studying that is spectroscopy. Right now, we are doing spectroscopy. This is blue in color. Light is falling on this. My eyes are the detector. Right? They are detecting the color. It's visible region. And I'm doing spectroscopy with my eyes. And so are all of you when we use visible light. So um, I don't know if, we, if everybody here did it in high school. We did. Um, so we, when you do benchtop spectroscopy using a UV vis spectrometer, you use light that passes through your sample. Um, then there is a, a detector. And from that detector comes an output, which gives you a spectrum. Now, in this spectrum, there are two lines. One is the red one for oxygenated hemoglobin and the blue one where nothing is bound to hemoglobin. There are two axes. The y-axis tells you how much light is absorbed or how intense or bright that object is, so typically um, if you see something that's very bright, a, a compound or a chemical, it means it's absorbing a lot of light. Um, and um, 
on the x-axis is the frequency which tells you what is the color of that object. And you can see that for ox oxygenated and non-oxygenated hemoglobin, the two spectrum are different, therefore resulting in the difference in colors. Now the key here is that each individual material has a distinct spectrum that uniquely identifies that material. So um, if I were to look at that red line, I would say, oh, that looks very like oxyhemoglobin. Let's say I, I saw that in an unknown sample that I don't know what it is at all. I would say, oh, that looks very like oxyhemoglobin. It probably has that plate-like iron molecule and oxygen bound to it. OK, so now changing gears from spectroscopy to X-ray spectroscopy. How are they different? Um, visible spectroscopy that you do with your eyes um, is in this region of energy. This is what you see, and this is what you detect. This is where we operate at SSRL, so much higher energies and much higher frequencies looking at atomic level um, changes. Um, and here, too, the same principle applies. Each individual material has a distinct spectrum that uniquely identifies that material. So all these three things, if you took a sample out of them, put it in the beam, you would see a different spectrum for each. All right. So at the experimental station, I want to go from, OK, I do X-ray spectroscopy, but where I do it. This is beam line 4.3 at SSRL. It's a very typical experimental station. Um, um, usually, you'll see a lot of cabling uh, and wires. This is actually a, a sparse beam line. I showed this picture because it's easier to understand. Um, there's yeah, a lot of cabling, a lot of monitors, it's computing. Um, and uh, let's forget about all of this now. Let's focus in this red region, OK? So let's make that bigger. We have x-rays that come from here, a sample that sits here, and a detector that sits here. It's exactly like the experiment that we do with visible light. We hit the sample with light instead of x-rays. Here's the sample. Here's a detector, which gives you the output. In X-ray spectroscopy, the output that you get looks kind of like this. Again, the y-axis tells you how much is absorbed, and the x-axis is telling you what frequency is absorbed. And um, these, you know, these different lines are from different um, chemicals. These are all iron, signal from iron chemicals. And those who are in the trade will look at these compounds and will be able to tell you one of them is, an, is iron oxide, or one of them is iron carbonate, or things like that. Now, the question is, what, what happens when light passes through a sample? What is happening that is giving rise to this spectrum? Right? So a quick X-ray spectroscopy 101 lesson uh, for you. This on the left is a, a schematic of an atom. This is a carbon atom, um, six electrons, and it has a nucleus in the center. Uh, now the things to remember, there's a lot to learn about X-ray spectroscopy, but the things to remember is that not all electrons in an atom are the same. Some are held more tightly than the others. So the closer to the nucleus, they're held more tightly. And it would make sense to you if I said the more tightly an electron is held in an atom, the more energy is required to knock it out, right? And um, the other thing is that if I took a, this is a carbon atom, right? If I took a nitrogen atom, which comes next in the periodic table, that would have seven electrons. The same electron of the nitrogen atom would require a different amount of energy to be knocked out. So if I want to knock out a specific electron in any atom, it's a different experiment, because it requires a different amount of energy. <coughs> so in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we target the most tightly held electrons, or the very inner electrons. And that's why we need X-rays generated at synchrotrons because we need those high energy x-rays to knock those electrons out. So um, this is the atom. We're hitting that very closely held electron with very high energy um, x-rays, which knocks that electron out, right? Now that atom is unhappy. It sees a little hole there where an electron used to sit, and it's saying, ah, I'm not happy. I want that hole to be filled with an electron. And so what it does, it looks at another electron that's sitting nearby and says, hey, electron, go and fill that hole. 
And that's what happens. The next nearby electron goes and fills that hole, and that process emits a signal. Okay? That process is emitting a signal which we capture to study. Okay? This emitted signal is captured by an expensive and sophisticated detector um, that is very uh, uh, relative, expensive, and sophisticated. <laughs> to, um, uh, for high energy physicists, it's very different. For uh, what we do, it's very different. For LCLS, it's different. But for us, it's still an expensive detector. OK. So the detector converts that signal that's coming out into data, which is what we use to study this metalloprotein. Um, and I, as I emphasized, obtaining a, s a signal from each type of element is a different experiment. And um, that's key for everybody to remember. So the measurement itself um, is done on protein samples. So this is what a protein sample looks like. Um, I take that, put it into a plastic container. Um, I've taken a picture next to a Sharpie so you know how much sample we require, very small amounts. Um, Immediately frozen in liquid nitrogen, very cold, minus 195 centigrade. Put into a chamber, which is even colder, at minus 263 degrees centigrade. Really fro frozen, very close down to absolute zero, so that we, we don't want any atoms in the samples to be moving around. And then the sample is put into the X-ray beam. X-ray is passed through it, a signal is emitted. And uh, we use that signal to get the data. Now, what I'm skipping over here a lot is that very careful tuning of the instrumentation is required to obtain precise energy of the x-rays. And every step of the experimental process needs to be optimized for me to be able to, to get reliable data. That requires very close collaboration uh, with researchers like me and beamline scientists who help us optimize the experiment. So, um, so now you know about the experiment. Um, what, what kind of information are you getting out of this? Right? I said, oh, we got all these data. <coughs> um, to answer that, let's assume the experiment is tuned for studying the molybdenum center in nitrogenase. It's that protein that takes Nitrogen from the air and makes it ammonia and has a crazy molybdenum center, yeah? We'll be knocking out an electron from the molybdenum atom. Okay, so the first thing that you learn is the structure. This is the whole woolly protein matrix. Here is the molyb tiny molybdenum center that's sitting in there. My experiment can only look in the near neighborhood of the metal. It's not going to see any of this. It's only going to be able to see what's happening here, right? So let's zoom in there. And specifically, the experiment will tell you how many of what type of atoms are at what distance from the molybdenum atom. So it's going to tell me, oh, there are three sulfur atoms at two and a half angstroms from the molybdenum, for example. So it'll give you that kind of structural information. <coughs> it will also give you a lot of chemical uh, information. Was the chemical form of the protein? How how strongly is it bonded to that sulfur? How strong is that bond? How many electrons are there in the molybdenum atom? So remember I told you how molybdenum, uh, whenever two atoms come together, there's a flow of electrons. How many electrons have either float, in, float into the molybdenum or out of it? Uh, we get to know that. How ready is it to react with some other small molecule? And why does it have certain catalytic properties? So you will be able to answer all of these questions um, the, from a chemical aspect and from a structural aspect if you do the spectroscopy that we do at SSRL. Yeah? Um, finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the scale of changes. So people who don't do spectroscopy or don't study metalloproteins, it's, uh, it's good to know at what scale we're operating. So proteins are typically 0.1 micron to 0.015 micron in size. But as I said, we're not looking at the whole protein. We're looking at that little metal center in there. And they are about 10 angstroms in size. So they're tinier, 10, 10 to the minus 10 meters. But even in that metal side, what I'm really looking at are very small changes in between 
atoms, right? I'm looking at the one to two angstrom region. And really, even in that region, what I can detect are changes that are very tiny, 0.1 to 0.5 angstroms, very small changes. And in answering how these distances have changed, we can answer questions like, how does that change the properties of the metalloprotein? So very small structural changes, uh, which are associated to chemical changes, which change the properties of these metalloproteins a lot. So um, it's a quiz. Um, it's more cookies <coughs> for who answers it. Um, so why does carbon, we all know carbon monoxide kill, kills us, right? Why does it kills, uh, kill us? Um, <coughs> The simple answer is that it causes hypoxia, which means it goes and binds to that iron center, knocks out the oxygen, and it binds much more strongly than oxygen. And because it's doing that, it doesn't allow oxygen to bind and go to different parts of the body, and you basically die of lack of oxygen. So you're going to ask me, didn't nature have millions of years to optimize this? Why didn't it make hemoglobin such that it bind oxygen the most strongly? Right, it bind more strongly than CO2, CEO, and all the other small molecules that are available biologically. <coughs> the answer is hemoglobin is an oxygen carrier protein. It has to go to the lung, it binds oxygen, right? If it bound too strongly, it'll go down to the cells and it won't let it won't let go. It has to bind just right so that the binding is doesn't require a lot of energy, and its release doesn't require a lot of energy either. So this, in essence, tells you that the chemistry of life is very precise. We need angstrom-level distance precision and very specific bond strengths for proper functioning of life. Um, so as a trivia, if the oxygen-oxygen bond distance in dioxygen, the oxygen that we breathe, changed by 0.1 angstroms, we'd all die because that means that oxygen has become superoxide. That will destroy everything. So it's, we're looking at changes that are so small in the body. OK. I talked a lot about proteins. I like to introduce modeling metalloenzymes. As we still have 10 minutes or so. Um, it's a branch of chemistry that focuses on generating small molecule mimics of metalloproteins. So we were looking at all these proteins. They're hard to make. Studying them is difficult. They're hard to extract them from organisms. They're sensitive. They're unstable. They're expensive to make. Um, so a, a big group of chemists, what they have done is they say, OK, I'm going to ignore all of this stuff, and I'm only going to look at the interesting metal part, which is doing all the chemistry. And so they look at that and say, OK, I'm going to make that in a test tube, just that part, and ignore everything else. Um, <coughs> With respect to that, I come to my example. Using this modeling aspect of metalloproteins to answer a question about another protein, which is called photosystem 2. Um, it's been in the news a lot from LCLS, also from SSR, so a lot of you are probably aware um, of photosystem 2. It's the oxygen evolving center in plants. That's the final step of oxygen evolution, that's what's producing oxygen that you breathe, enabling you to survive. Uh, it's a huge protein. It's a massive, one of the biggest, craziest proteins around. Um, it has multiple subunits um, in it and has several cofactors. Cofactors are um, uh, external or standalone um, small molecules that come and bind to a protein and enable its function. They could be chloride, they could be small atoms to small molecules. Okay. Now, the, the fun stuff happens, or the oxygen evolution actually happens somewhere here in this um, cluster. Um, I have made a schematic of it for, you, for it to be clearer. This cluster, which doesn't really have a shape, um, has four manganese atoms, five oxygen atoms, and one calcium atom. And pe people have, for decades, have been trying to understand why does this protein have such a strange catalytic site? Why does it need a calcium atom in it? And what happens if the calcium is removed? By the way, if it's removed, no photosynthesis, no oxygen evolution. So let's go back to the dietary element chart again. Um, 
fat protein has the essential trace element, manganese, but it also has this calcium, which is not essential trace. It's actually essential in large quantities, essential everywhere. Uh, but the thing here is that calcium is not an essential trace element, and therefore it does not have the same flexible reactivity properties as manganese. So as remember I told you how metals have this special ca um, property of reacting with either uh, paired electrons or separate electrons. Calcium doesn't do that. So for most, uh, most people in initially believed that the calcium was just hanging out there for some structural reason and apparently was not particip participating in this oxygen evolution chemistry. But more recently, people have been questioning it. Is it really there, not doing anything? Um, so oxygen evolution by the photosystem is, is, looks like a very simple reaction. Two water molecules give you an oxygen molecule with some electrons and protons. It's actually quite a complex process. It's one of the very complex reactions in metalloenzymes. Um, the, the protein, this is that manganese calcium oxygen center, goes through several different states, and these states have to be synchronized with photon pulses from light, with electron channeling. Um, it's more like something like this, where each of these steps is necessary for oxygen to be released. And this is just a schematic of how oxygen is released from two water molecules. Oxygens are formed. Protons and electrons are released, which are then whisked away by other molecules for other purposes. And oxygen comes out for you to breathe. Now, the final step before oxygen is released, um, supposedly the oxygen is held by a manganese atom. We don't know exactly, we don't exactly know for sure which manganese atom. There are four of them. And I've just drawn it schematically. Okay, this is manganese atom is holding this oxygen before it comes off. So uh, I'm dividing it into this calcium, which is hanging out there, this manganese and this oxygen, right? And this is, even though it's only um, nine atoms, it's very hard to make this in the lab um, inside a test tube. So can we model it with something very simple? We said, okay, let's forget about manganese even, or oxygen. Let's try to make a molecule which can make and bind to oxygen, okay? Now, this looks nothing like the manganese I mean, center. This looks completely different from this. But nonetheless, um, we tried to see, can we study how this releases this oxygen a molecule um, and um, try to gain inferences from that? Now. Even though it's so very different, and this molecule appears to be very small, making these molecules that bind to oxygen is very hard work. And um, this paper was published in a very prominent um, article in the journal Nature, which tells you that these are, this is hard work to even make these molecules. Um, so you're going to say, uh, where is the calcium in this molecule? Isn't that what you're studying? What's the role of calcium? Okay, so I'm going to tell you, well, let's do it one step at a time. We take this molecule and want to react it with calcium. Um, my, si my synthetic collaborators who actually make this stuff um, tried and tried and tried and couldn't bind calcium to it. And this, they said, well, we are going to optimize the step by binding something else which we feel will probably bind better than calcium. So they tried um, yttrium and scandium which are like calcium. There are some properties that are like calcium. I won't go into that, but yeah, there are some properties that are like calcium. And these are not biological, right? <coughs> so they, they threw in this molecule into the pot of synthesis. And they saw that this molecule, the properties of this molecule changed. Okay? Um, so they observed some changes in chemistry, but they didn't know, one, if yttrium was actually going and binding somewhere, and of course, if they didn't know that, they didn't know if it was binding, where and how, okay? So they called me up and said, um, can you help us figure this out? So what we did was first we did, okay, let's look at the starting molecule, this guy, 
Um, and this, this is the, nitrogen, the iron and nitrogen part. This is called a TMC. Ligand, which is bound, more importantly, which is bound to this oxygen. Now this is uh, a data set, a Fourier transform data set from the XFS experiments that we did. Basically shows a plot of intensity versus distance and gives you the information at what distance are other atoms around that iron atom. So you see how there's a lot of intensity between 1 and 3. All the atoms that it can detect are within that um, range of distance. Now the hypothesis here is that if yttrium or scandium bind to this small molecule, the spectrum should change to reflect their binding. Right? So that's what we did. We took the molecule with yttrium, um, and we see, lo and behold, when yttrium binds, there's this big peak which shows up um, here, which is attributed to the yttrium. And when you take this and solve its structure, it appears that the yttrium binds in a diamond shape with the iron molecule. Here's the yttrium, here is the two oxygen in the middle, and that's the iron. And while we were studying this, my synthetic friends figured out how used the techniques that they used to, to make yttrium bind, they figured out how to bind biologically relevant elements like calcium, strontium, and zinc. <coughs> so we studied those. The question was, do biologically relevant elements bind differently? Uh, the answer was, in each case, they don't really. They bind to these oxygen. They make this diamond. In this case, the diamond bond is broken here. But the idea is that in each case, these elements bind to one or both oxygen atoms. So armed with the structural information, we look at what happens to their reactivity properties. Okay. So what is, what is its role in oxygen released by these small molecules? So the photosystem under catalytic conditions inside the plants releases oxygen. This molecule, when you have um, yttrium, scandium, or zinc, does not release any oxygen. But curiously, when you have calcium and strontium, it releases its oxygen. And what's really cool about this is that photosystem, this guy, if you remove that calcium, no photosynthesis. If you replace it with anything else, no photosynthesis. But you, if you replace that with strontium, it retains its catalysis. So this small molecule, which looks nothing like this guy, is replicating that part of the chemistry. Only with calcium and strontium, oxygen is released right, with nothing else. So we combine these with some other spectroscopic techniques. That's what we do. We take synchrotron techniques with other optical um, spectroscopy <coughs> techniques together. We come to a hypothesis. And we figured out that the calcium has very specific properties that are allowing the oxygen release. It's binding just right. The other atoms, like yttrium, scandium, and zinc, they bind too tightly to the oxygen and do not allow um, the oxygen release. So this precise tuning of reactivity is important. So the take-home lesson here um, is that calcium, you know, tunes the reactivity such that oxygen release can happen normally. And it gets us one step closer in understanding the role of different atoms in the OEC. So now we know what calcium is doing there. Um, there's a whole bunch of people studying what uh, what's happening at the manganese atoms. And that's harder because there are four of them. Uh, nonetheless, there are some very smart people studying that. Um, and hopefully, we'll find an answer very soon. Uh, this study also helps chemists in making an industrial scale water oxidation catalyst. So there's a lot of chemists who study, who do bio-inspired catalysis. They look at the biology and they say, oh, this guy does oxygen evolution. So can I make something like this, which is in, in an industrial, which can be replicated in an industrial scale, to make oxygen? So na since now they know what the role of calcium is, they can now replace it with something else or tune their chemistry in the one-part synthesis to um, generate a better catalyst at the industrial scale. Now I, with that, I come to the end of my talk. Um, I'd like to leave you with a few lessons about metals in biology. Um, the first is that I hope that I've been able to emphasize that metals are an integral 
part of our biological makeup. That metals perform critical reactions that have wide applicability to health, energy, and the environment. And finally, that there's a critical balance of chemistry of metals in biology. They cannot work too well or too badly. They have to be just right to ensure our continued survival. With that, acknowledgments. Um, with peop uh, Dr. Nam is a person in Korea who I work with who was the synthetic person sweating over the test tubes and beakers making the, pro the samples for us and all the people at SSRL uh, who allow me to do the research. And thank you for your attention. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions.